Well, thank you all for making it out this evening. Uh, I got quite a few slides here, and it's kind of a mixture talk, simply because uh, most people aren't very familiar with digital rock analysis, and so I, I do cover a little bit about what the tools are, the technology, and then going directly into the application. Of course, the title of my talk is Investigation of New Production Targets in the Springer Shale Using DRA Techniques. So uh, we will be talking about the Springer Shale, which is really the Goddard Shale in uh, Mississippi in, uh, in age. So we'll be covering kind of the problem and objective, an overview, some basics on whole core CT analysis for those who are not familiar with that, petrophysical analysis on that data that's derived from those techniques, Comparison or kind of an integration of both digital and physical lab measurements with regards to porosity. And then I like to, this little fun section, it's what else is possible. Uh, there's just so much more we can do in the realm of imaging analysis on rocks uh, that can be automated and digitized in, in various forms. And this is kind of like a little bit of a teaser on what that would be, what, what that might look like. And then ultimately, how do I make use of that data when I'm trying to upgrade or update uh, well log analysis package or something like that. The end of the game is always taking core data, upscaling that to wireline, and then using that as you step away from those wells. So this exploration target is newer and not well understood. I think some of the first wells in the Springer uh, more recently were about two and a half years ago. And it was primarily uh, kind of bypassed pay it was there people were heading down to the Woodford and they kind of got a little bit of a show, and a few operators, Continental and I think uh, Mar Marathon and a few others, started to investigate this shale. And there was some recent completions there over the past year and a half, and they were getting a lot of good production. So it added initial reserves on top of the reserves already in those Woodford wells. And since they already had rights to the Woodford, they had kind of additional reserves to add on top for kind of on the, on the way down, dropping by and for additional target zones. Uh, we're going to look at some key reservoir parameters that can be derived from digital rock analysis and then understand the linkage between the digital and physical methods, which is always kind of a controversial subject. And then kind of look at some of the what else is possible area, uh, investigate the use of machine learning algorithms for looking at these rocks and kind of assisting the geologists with taking textual information and pulling that out of the images themselves. So we have two wells we're dealing with. On one well, we have 146 feet of core. And for the digital side, we took about 10 plugs. And for the physical side, about 31 plugs. And well two, just five rotary side wells, so not very much. And on that, we ran full analysis for all on the digital side, but none on the physical side. So it's always ideal if I can get both sides of the story, get physical and digital and overlap them. In this case, we couldn't get a direct overlap just from the nature of how things were run. But there's still tons of information and value and being able to see how these two techniques compare with one another. So this is a, a nice slide to kind of get everybody started on what, what digital rock analysis is about and kind of the methods themselves. As you can see, we have different magnitudes of scale. And if any of you are familiar working your own plays, you know you got seismic, then you got wireline, and then you get core data. And there's orders of magnitude difference between those scales. And how do we understand connecting these and upscaling these to one another? Uh, Digital rock analysis suffers from the same challenge, but it's at a much finer scale. And so we kind of pick up on the wireline scale and try to link the whole core data sets to the wireline. And then from there, look at the core plugs at a very high resolution. So the resolution is primarily dictated by the rock itself. So in shales, you require SCM analysis to see the pore systems in those. And then furthermore, we go a little bit finer resolution to quantify three-dimensional properties of these pores where we can then simulate fluid flow properties. Everything we quantify at that scale is really a matrix prop property. So if you're looking to understand how a well is performing just based on this data set, you're going to be missing a big piece of the puzzle, primarily completion design. So this is one of the big pieces of the puzzle to help understand what drives a productive reservoir. So we're going to start off with the whole core scale. Uh, little basics on whole core CT. Uh, this technique was not invented by the company I work for. It was actually uh, first researched at Shell back in the early 80s. And they were applying this technique, uh, dual energy scanning, very early on. But it, was, it really wasn't commercial, and they really hadn't calibrated it just well, primarily due to the limitation of technology. 
about 2008, technology had caught up and we could actually calibrate and compute properties from whole core CTs very rapidly at a very fine scale. So just to give everybody a little heads up on the evolution of this technology, when I started working with whole core CT scanning, the resolution that we acquired vertically was 625 microns. So that's, you know, a little more than half a millimeter of resolution vertically. Currently, the tools that we use scan at about 330 microns. And there are already in development new tools being developed for the medical field, which we always retrofit for oil and gas, at 75 microns for whole core. So this is all happening in the course of nine years the types of information we can quantify from these images. So the question is, where, is it, where, is this, where are these techniques going to be in five years? Where are they going to be in 10 years? And how might we make use of those techniques today, build a foundation that's really going to help us understand our rocks moving forward? Uh, so single energy versus dual energy. Dual energy is what the, prop, the technique that allows us to compute both bulk density and photoelectric factor, whereas single energy doesn't allow us to do that. Uh, calibrations are fairly standard. We, we use uh, rods in conjunction with our scans of known materials so that we can compute the properties at every, at every line of resolution for the, for the core. And there you go, those are resolution lines. Um, so here's an example of what that might look like. Whole core, dual energy, CT basics. Uh, I'm showing you a slab of a core. So this core is actually in the aluminum barrel. You can see the aluminum sleeves on the side. This is how the rocks are typically scanned. Digitally, we can look at every slice we want in this image, and I'm zooming into one little section there to kind of show you the individual pixels, well, technically they're voxels, these voxels and their resolution requirements. So, like I said, on the long dimension, that's 330 microns, and then in the X and Y dimension, which is left and right, that's 275 microns, and so that's why they're not perfect square cubes, they're rectangular prisms. And this is the information we quantify through the length of the core. So let's kind of get on with the show here. How do we use this in the Springer? So we were working with a client who was making a trip down to the Woodford and they decided we want to take some cores out of the Springer. And this is the 146 foot section. If you're looking at this section, you can see very clearly a ton of information, which I'll be describing with you in a second here. On the left, we have spectral gamma. So you have your thorium, potassium, and uranium concentrations through the section. Now, one of the interesting things about the Springer is it has a very, very depressed thorium uh, reading. And even the uranium reading can be a little bit low. So as you're kind of heading down to the Woodford, you're seeing a little kick and some shows in this section. But then you kind of go a little bit further and you hit the Woodford and it's a big kick. You see that stick out like a sore throne. And the reality is, is that the Woodford is a world-class self-sourcing shale. The Springer is a thinner section doesn't really have that high API count that you would get in the Woodford, but we've still seen the production is actually quite remarkable. And looking at the nanoscale, which we'll be going over here in a little bit, the pore systems are still just as, are, are, are nearly identical. There's some very sm slight differences from the Woodford, and that's why they've, uh, many operators have had a lot of success drilling this play. Uh, on the next track, I'm showing you a lithology uh, log. Now that is actually computed when you combine the, the bulk density and photoelectric factor response, which is measured from the whole core scan, with the thorium, potassium, and uranium readings from the gamma ray. So my apologies, this is really small here, so you can't see a ton of detail. But that's, this is all computed by the combination of those five data sets. Bulk density from whole core CT, photoelectric factor from whole core CT, thorium, potassium, and uranium from the spectral gamma logger. Run a little bit of petrophysics, you can build a predictive model at high resolution. So we're talking here at 330 micron resolution. The important thing to remember about this resolution is simply that a lot of the shales that we're dealing with today, uh, Wolf Camp is a great example, you see a lot of laminations at a very fine scale, millimeter scale. Those cannot really be picked up by wireline logs at your six inch scale. So there has been a huge movement for the adoption of whole core CT scanning when dealing with complex unconventional rocks because you can actually resolve all of those features at, the, at that scale necessary to drive a very robust core analysis program. And at the end of the day, you're really trying to figure out where am I going to take my plugs and my cores from where I'm going to derive geologic information so that I can plug it into a petrophysical model as I step out away from my core at interval, from my pilot well. 
that's, that's really the end goal here. Oh, sorry about that. There we go. I had a little animation there. So on the right, I'm showing you cross plot of just the whole core CT data. And you can't really make out those axes, but the y-axis is bulk density. So the low bulk density values are at the top, and the high bulk density values are at the bottom. And the x-axis is the photoelectric factor. So you have your low values on the left and your high values on the right. So if you're moving from left to right on the PEF uh, axis, you would expect to become more calcareous as you move from left to right. So you're silicious on the left, you're calcareous on the right, and you kind of get your dolomite somewhere in the middle. On the bulk density axis on, uh, for the Y, you're going to have your higher porous systems or higher organic matter on, near the top of the graph, and your tighter rocks near the bottom where the high density values are. So looking at this data set, I'm actually populating the entire set of whole core CT data overlaid by population density. So right there, you can see a majority of the data points are kind of falling around this 2.7 uh, PEF response and about 2.48 bulk density. I know it's kind of tough to read, but you'll just have to trust me on that one. And what we can do with that data set is we can combine all of our knowledge, which right now, if you look at that well log, all of that is derived from the whole core CT scan. We'll take five dimensions of information, namely TOC predictions from those data sets, silica, carbonate, clay, and brittleness index, which is computed from those combination of those four. And we'll take those five and we'll plug them into a multi-step machine learning algorithm to build a cluster, to build cluster mappings. So if anybody's familiar with machine learning and cluster, clustering algorithms, there's a, lot of, there's a lot going on right now in the world of deep learning and machine learning. But we've, made, we've retrofitted some of those applications for geologic purposes. And what you can end up doing is you can create a multi-dimensional cluster mapping spatially through your rock. And so what you see here is an overlay of those different clusters that the algorithm is determining are similar or different in certain ways. And this is in more than two dimensions. I'm showing you a two-dimensional plot here, but this is a five-dimensional cluster mapping, so you actually will see some overlap in these dimensions, so you wouldn't expect to see any straight lines or anything like that. Once we've built this model, we propagate it out vertically, which you can see right here along the length of the core. And so you can see a majority of the data points, if you look at that population density, are falling in that hunter green section with some in that blue. And so that's why you kind of see that vertically propagated out along the length of the core. This is what we use to drive our core analysis program. This is pretty standard now in the uh, unconventional space. So you will pick your plug locations based off the distribution of these properties acquired at high resolution. So you're not missing anything. And that's one of the big things. Uh, not only is that one of the big things, is the speed at which we do this. So these scans are done about 200 and something feet a day can be done in one of these machines. So cores are taken out of the ground, arrive at a facility, scanned about 200 and something feet in a day. These logs are probably produced about two or three days after that. So these decisions are being made within a week after the core has left the, left the ground. You wouldn't normally get to this step in a, just a physical only method until after the core was extruded, cleaned, slabbed, and you had a chance to go look at it uh, physically. That might take anywhere from four to six weeks in many cases. Uh, so this is a, a, there's a big time save here and, and many operators are still learning how can they make use of these time savings. Some people are investigating the use of this technology for landing zones, uh, getting core analysis data points within a completion time frame. Uh, there's a variety of different purposes that people are using this for, and it's really just getting more and more numerous. On the bottom, I'm showing you a ternary diagram where we took X-ray fluorescence readings along the length of the core, uh, much larger spacing, just to kind of validate that the whole core parameters were predicting accurately. And they were. It wasn't. It wasn't. Um, it was no really no surprise there. We've been doing this for many many years. So blue is what you guys have uh, looked at. Well, blue is for the first well, and the orange, which surely should be gray, so that's a mistake there. I think it changed the colors when I pulled it in. Uh, is for the second well, which we took five rotaries for. And how are you guys analyzing the clay content? Clay content was analyzed using X-ray fluorescence. You can actually. From the X-ray fluorescence spectrometer, you can pick up aluminum concentrations, and you can build proxies uh, to X-ray XRD data from where you can build a prediction for how much clay you have in your system. 
But you can also use the thorium, potassium, and uranium concentrations from the spectral gamma, which is what we used on the whole core to build the, uh, the gray curve here in the lithology chart showing you total clay concentrations. Okay. So if you look along the length of this section, you can see that the clay is slowly depressing as you go lower and lower into the rock. So it's really high clay concentrations. And as you go lower towards the target zone, it actually drops down. So the average clay concentrations for this section were about 30% uh, by weight. So I'm just showing you an extended view here where we break out all the different curves. Like once again, this is all generated about five days after the cores arrive at a, at, a, at, a, at a facility. There's a variety of companies that do this kind of work. Uh, we've been doing it for quite a while ourselves. Uh, but these are all the different things you can get out of your core at high resolution without having to extrude it from the aluminum barrels themselves. So keep that in mind. Start at the whole core level. Built a general understanding or a geologic framework from that technology. And we're going to use that information as we go deeper at the high resolution scale. The high resolution scale is very exciting because this is where you're starting to resolve features like porosity, organic matter volumes, and looking at textual information and how that textual information compares across one formation to another. But before you can do that, you have to do so a little bit of a technology prep here for everybody. You have to polish some rocks. And so if anybody's ever worked at a, at a physical rock lab or done some work when you're at school and you had to polish some thin sections for petrographic analysis, some things never change. We have to polish these rocks at a very fine resolution before we start investigating them with an SEM. And so the technology used for that is usually an argon ion beam. Uh, you can use xenon gas. There's a variety of different gases. It shoots charged ions at the surface of a rock. And using a mask, you can kind of snow plow a very fine polished area. Uh, you cannot do this through physical methods. It's, if I were to polish this with like a 500 nanometer grit polish that you would be acceptable for a thin section, it, this would look like the Rocky Mountains. And so it, it wouldn't work at all. And so looking on here, I'm showing you on the top the polished surface from where we're going to acquire all of our images. And on the bottom is the unpolished surface. So if you imagine a snow plow coming from the north here and going south, leaving all that leftover snow on the bottom, that's really all the leftover rock that we didn't polish. And we're going to work in the polished surface only. On those surfaces, we're going to acquire two different kinds of images, backscatter images and secondary electron two images. Uh, both of these are going to be done at quite low energies, and there's reasons for that. Uh, but the benefits of a secondary two electron image is that it's very surface specific. Uh, we're not going to be acquiring electrons from deep within the sample. So this is known as interaction volume. And the backscatter image which has its own benefits, actually reads electron interactions from deeper within the sample. And so you get a little bit more of a noisy image, but it does a much better job at resolving uh, mineral features, beddings, uh, sometimes in some cases TOC, things of that nature. These both are caught discreetly. We can combine them into one image and kind of get the best of both worlds, or we can keep them separate for various purposes. But usually the rule of thumb for secondary two electron images will quantify porosity information and TOC, and for the backscatter images, we can double check our TOCs and look at mineral boundary information. This is the concept of interaction volume I was just describing, so I'm just kind of reiterating here. That first line at the top is where we read the secondary electron images from, and so you don't really reading deep into the sample. The backscatter is kind of showing you the middle there. And so if you kind of think about this, we're looking down at the rock from those SEM images. And so if you were using a backscatter image for quantifying porosity, if you had a pore that only went down this far, you wouldn't see that very well in a backscatter image. Uh, this pore is kind of coming out at an angle here and going back in, so you'll see that on the backscatter image, but you'll probably see some kind of an average uh, diameter as opposed to an actual diameter at the top slice. So a secondary electron 2 will tell me the diameter is this value from here to here, where a backscatter might give me an average somewhere right around here is a diameter. But that's, this is actually a good scenario for this pore, but there's tons of pores <coughs> that are much smaller than that that would be naked or into, like, invisible to a backscatter image, and that's why you have to use SE2 images for porosity determinations. A little kind of a geochem background or for, for shales. Oops, sorry about that.
lost my mic there for a second. Uh, when all shales start off immature, you have some originally de deposited organic matter, and then you get those through a long process of burial, diagenesis, eventually catagenesis, and the organic matter starts to cook. Uh, or really, the, uh, the carrageen starts to cook and produce uh, pyrobitumin, bitumens, and mobilize hydrocarbons into a pore network that's developing in these organic material. So as you go through this process, you start developing pores in the organics themselves. Uh, this is what we call uh, apparent transformation ratio for images, and we're essentially able to compute how much pores were generated during the maturation process. Uh, that's a little bit of an oversimplification. There's a lot more to that, but for the most part, we found that the ATR value, apparent transformation ratio, has a significant, uh, can tell you a lot about the reservoir quality of your rock. You want more of these pores to be connected. You want more pores in your organics because these are going to be your oil wet pores and they're going to build the highway or the pathways for hydrocarbons to actually move through your matrix. And so this is all matrix properties. So you got to combine this with some knowledge about completion design to figure out how you can build a productive uh, well. So what does that look like? So what I'm showing you here is called fraction of perimeter. Uh, if, you, if you look at these two different colors, I have a magenta color and a light blue color. And now I'm looking at a resolution of about uh, 10 nanometers on one of these polished surfaces. This is an SE2, so we're only dealing with surface features here. And these perimeters are, these are all perimeters of the pores themselves, but the colors are representing the type of perimeter it is. So a magenta perimeter I'm showing you here is a pore to, uh, a pore to grain interface and the light blue is a pore to organic interface. So if you just thinking about this, here's a long pore and this pore is interacting with grain. And it's interacting with grain pretty much the entire length of the pore until you get to about this section right here. Now it's interacting with organic. These pores right here are mostly interact, they're kind of 50-50, interacting with organic here and interacting with grain. And these pores are completely surrounded by organic material, so the entire interface is touching organic. So it's a complete pore to organic interface. Using these distributions on every single pore, we can start classifying pore types with a few basic thresholds. So in this case, what we'd like to do is say, anything greater than a 25% perimeter to organic material, we're going to label that an organic matter hosted pore. So that shows up as blue here. So all of these pores had more than 25% interface, or at least 25% interface with organics, at least. If it's less than 25% interface with organic, we're not going to call it an organic matter hosted pore. So what we're saying is that one time in the past, these pores were filled with organic material and they developed during the maturation process. So these are the pores that you want to understand because these are the pores that are oil wet and are going to be driving your hydrocarbon flow. So if you have more of these, that's really good. If you have less of these uh, in a self-sourcing shale, it's really good. But if you, don't have, if you have less of these, it's, it's maybe not so good. And it's really going to be formation specific. So these kind of studies need to be done in conjunction with physical lab measurements and geologic information at the regional scale to figure out what these properties mean. But these are properties that can be computed across all different kinds of shales. What we do is we take this blue pore, which I'm calling porosity associated with organic matter, PAOM, and you divide it by the sum of PAOM and organic matter. So in this image, the organic matter is this dark gray material, which I'm now highlighting as green. And if I take the sum of both of those, I will get this apparent transformation ratio, or ATR. So blue divided by the sum of blue and green. So how much of that original organic matter has converted into porosity? Anything that's left over that's a pore that didn't meet our cutoff, we're going to call it intragranular or intragranular porosity. And the sum of PAOM, which is the organic matter hosted porosity, and the intra or intragranular porosity is going to be my effective porosity. And we'll go on more about what does that mean, effective porosity, and how does this compare to physical lab measurements. So here's an example in the Springer. So we see tons of fun information here. Uh, anything that's black is going to be your porosity. Anything that's dark gray is going to be organic material. Now, you can't tell the difference between kerogen, bitumen, and that kind of information from these SEM images, but we can call it organic matter. We know that much. Everything else is your grain matrix. Uh, in an SE2, you can't very easily tell the difference between 
at least from an intensity value perspective, uh, quartz and calcite, but with the backscatter, you can actually see those differences. So you would combine the best of both worlds. So if I were to segment this image, which is the process of building the rock model at the scale, I start getting my porosity information. So blue is my organic matter pores. So we're going to say that everything that blue is blue was once upon a time organic material filled. And everything that's red was never filled with organics. It was kind of in situ porosity prior to catagenesis. And some of these is my effective porosity. And so I'm getting an effective porosity of 4.27% in this image. Uh, organic, by, these are all volume percents, by the way. Um, organic volume percent, 8.21%. PAOM, which is the blue, or the organic matter hosted pores, is 2.92%, uh, and so the apparent transformation ratio is 0.26. So 26% of the original organic matter has converted into porosity. So let's take a look at some large overviews. If you guys remember what this, we're looking at here, we got the polished section on the top, and we got this kind of unpolished area at the bottom. So all of our analysis is in the polished section. Uh, another interesting feature that we notice on all of these rocks at this scale, and so the scale here is about one millimeter across the entire thing. This is the kind of scale you need to get to to resolve uh, pore features. Uh, we see a lot of these little fractures, tons of these little micro fractures or nano fractures, if you will. Uh, most of those I don't believe are in situ, but uh, there's a lot of discussion about are these uh, stress, uh, stress fractures at the finest scale from the expulsion of, of, or bringing the core up to the surface. Uh, where are these features occurring? And we typically see them at this scale. We see them at the large scale too. If you do whole core scans, you'll see these really big fractures and pucking effects. But at the nano scale, you can see these little features kind of parallel to bedding planes uh, occurring. And you can look uh, for mineral growths in between them. You can look to see if they were once closed. And in many cases, you can see that they were once closed just based on the fact that there is no growths in between them. There is no organic matter in between them, and you can some, sometimes see the grains, almost like uh, te plate tectonics, where they would fit together if they were closed. You'll see a lot of those features in these images, knowing that they were actually once closed. And so uh, many people, and I'm one of those, uh, are under the impression that these were uh, stressed uh, points of relaxation as the, the cores are being brought to the surface where stress is being released, and they're kind of expanding, the, core, the rock's expanding after you pull off all that pressure. So you'll see a lot of that information here. We'll take this image and we'll image uh, about 10 to 15 images at high resolution. And these are the, re the images at the resolution where you can quantify porosity information, organic matter information. So I'm kind of showing you here uh, 4.28 porosity on here, 3.84, 6.71. And you can see varying concentrations of organic material. Uh, we can compute all these properties from the images, which is a lot of fun. And one of the unique things about that is that you it's not just a scalar number in an Excel spreadsheet that you might get from a physical lab measurement, but it provides a lot of geologic context and textual information that you can't get anywhere else. Uh, you have to get to this scale to see these kinds of things. Here's another sample in the Springer. So you can see in this one some really large fractures, but I would say a lot of these are fairly uh, real. And you can see that because there's a lot of organic material in between that fracture. So that was some kind of an organic highway in the surface. And there's actually been some thin section work done on these that I don't have in this presentation, but uh, they were presented at APG MidCon two years ago, showing you these kind of features at the thin section scale with the high amounts of organic material. So these features you can see were there, and they're not like your typical microfracture features that you would see with probably were created when it was depressurized. Lots more organic material in this section. Uh, so you can see that kind of represented in the images themselves. So organic on the left is 10.26% by volume, 8.77 uh, and 8.61% by volume on the, the next two images. Uh, ATRs range from about 0.25 to 0.37 in these images. And it's really hard to see that, so my apologies. I'm trying, I got a lot of information here to share with you guys. but. Uh, these are, these are excellent quality rocks right here. Uh, people who see these kind of images and they're familiar with using digital rock analysis are very happy when they see features like this. They see a lot of porosity for shale, right? Four to 5%, in some cases 7%. Uh, 
Uh, and most of that porosity is organic matter hosted. So they know these are oil wet pores that can contribute to production. So the challenge is going to be their completions of the well and the steering of the well to make sure they stay within the section because these are, the springer is actually not as thick, so they have to be really careful about staying in those zones. And what we're going to do is we're going to start acquiring 3D FibSem volumes from these sections in the rock. And so FibSem volume is on the same instrument here. This is a FibSem focused ion beam scanning electron microscope. And what you can do is you take a picture and then you polish off about five nanometers thick with a focused ion beam. And you refocus and you take another picture. And you repeat this over and over again for about four or five hundred slices. And then you do some reconstruction and you eventually build a three-dimensional model. So the idea here is how can, can I connect the features I'm seeing at the 2D SEM scale, porosity namely, with the pore system in 3D and what would, it do, what would happen if I start simulating fluid flow properties at that scale. And that's kind of where this is going. You have to do this in a stair-step manner, one at a time, and you always have to validate with physical lab measurements. You can't really do this alone. So the combination of both of these techniques is uh, mutually beneficial and really gives you a confident understanding that you know what's going on at the nanoscale. So these are the techniques that are really showing and revealing a lot of that information. Here's another example. I would say that is not an in-situ fracture. Nice, clean, black, you know, break. Uh, there's not much going on between there, so that was probably created during pressure release. Uh, you can see large bodies of organic material kind of floating around there in a kind of a clay uh, siliceous matrix. Uh, a lot of the pore system you can't see at this resolution, but you can get textual inform information at this level, which we'll talk about in a little bit. So looking once again at this information, once we zoom in to higher resolutions, we can start quantifying porosity information, TOC by volume. So all of these data sets we're producing here is ultimately going to be plugged into a petrophysical model so that you can train your wireline logs and then start stepping out as you move away from these wells. We're going to take a look at some more 3D areas in a second. So here you go. It's been a second. <laughs> Uh, so I'm showing you across two wells here, well one and well two. Uh, there's different zones that these are required from, but this is the process from which we took an SEM, sliced it, and took a picture at every slice and reconstructed to build a 3D volume. And we can then start computing the same type of properties in 3D and building three-dimensional models that we simulate on. So looking at some of the information here, it's fairly similar, 3.9%, 6% porosity. 6.3% porosity, organics ranging between 7 and 12% by volume. Everything's fairly consistent. We're, we're pretty confident that we're getting a strong understanding of this formation. Taking a look at some more of these, that one on the right you can see a large organic matter body. So that's, that was actually selected because we saw that feature at the 2D scale and we wanted to understand what was going on in the third dimension. And so porosity is around seven and as low as five, four point three percent in these right here connected and ATRs are all within that 2.5 to 0.4 range. Then we start simulating uh, permeability values. So you can see that here, horizontal permeability, 3.83 uh, nanodarcies. These are all nanodarcies. Uh, 73, the one on the right, like I said, we selected that specifically because we saw some interesting features, 14.25. So that's, that's pretty high from Nano Darcy, uh, 1,425. And you can see that if you have uh, that higher amount of organics, you, you can really start producing higher perms. And that's because the organics are really the pathway that these pore networks are developing in. So on the two outside rocks, we have 13.5% organics and we get 1,400 Nano Darcy's. On the one on the left, 14.9% organics, 383 Nano Darcy's. When the organic porosity starts to drop, you're going to see those perms start to drop. So this is very useful information to understand where do I need to land my target zone? How well is my matrix permeability going to assist my completion design? Uh, this is one of those predictors that will really help you understand what's driving a strong well. Here's a couple more examples. Um, not too much there, but what happens is if I take all these and I combine and build a regression model, and I compare that to the Woodford Library, for example, because there's not a whole bunch of these. This is really the only well we've done in the Springer. 
So we were trying to quantify how does this compare to kind of everyday reservoirs. Uh, you can see it, the Springer Shale comes in on the higher end. It comes in on the higher end of porosities for your Woodfords, and it comes in on the higher end of permeabilities. So that's a good thing. That's a good thing. So if you are an operator and you have some held by production uh, Springer allocated to your name because you're drilling in the Woodford, this is additional reserves that you can book and you can actually complete in. And that's important because that's going to drive a lot of value. And it's accessible. It's permeable. It's connected, which is key. So now we're going to take a look at some of the physical lab measurements and see how does it compare. So what we're looking at here is the effective porosity value. This is a crushed rock analysis where we run a retort. If you're not familiar with the retort, uh, there are kind of two ways you can run a crushed rock analysis. You can either run a Dean Stark extraction or you can run a retort. And in this one, we opted for a retort because we can actually kind of cook off, you go to higher temperatures in a retort, cook off all the water in the sample, but you can actually measure from where that water came. This is important in shales because there's a lot of water being bound to the clays. And you have to understand what's my relationship between total porosity and effective porosity. And that big difference is going to be clay bound water or, or interstitial water, the, the water within the clay lattice itself. So if you look here very closely, total porosity, effective porosity, um, I've made the axes both 15 to have a nice comparison. Uh, if they were equal, they'd be right on the y equal x line, kind of perfect 45. But you can see right about the, the 7.5% total porosity mark, there's a drop. The slope drops. And what I did is I overlaid this with clay bound water, which was computed from uh, the retort itself. And you can see uh, there's low clay bound water on that, that kind of high slope line. And as soon as you hit that little hinge point and you get a lower slope, clay bound water starts to increase. And so you see a deviation from effective porosity uh, and total porosity. So it just shows you that that total porosity, you may be getting 15%, 12.5, you're getting these high numbers. None of that, a lot of that is not carrying any hydrocarbons at all. And it's not even contributing to your production because that's just clays with water blocking. So you compute total porosity is not really what's going to help you understand the production in your reservoir. It's the effect of porosity. You have to understand how that's, compute, or how that's affecting it. So this is why petrophysicists always compute V shale, get a total amount of clay, and then compute uh, this uh, amount of clay by water. Just to kind of hit home the point here, I overlaid this with concentrations of smectite. So there is smectite in this play. So you need to understand you want to avoid smectite uh, as a target zone. You know, and you've got to be careful about what kind of drilling mud you choose. But uh, you can see that those samples that have the big discrepancy between effective porosity and total porosity are the samples that have the high concentrations of smectite. So that's consistent. That's great. Story's making sense. I'm understanding my total porosity and my effective porosity relationship at the nanoscale. I'm getting valuable textual information. I'm quantifying which pores are really contributing to my production, and I'm finding out what percent of my total porosity is actually hurting my production by way of smectite in this example. Then I'm overlaying that with structural water, which, no surprise here, high amounts of structural water. So the, the size of the symbol means higher amounts of structural water. You're getting that kind of on those red zones on the right there. So high clay bound water, high structural water, culprit is smectite in this case. Showing you by depth, uh, just as you can see, this is actually occurring in the shallower zones of the Springer. So you want to stay away from the shallower, the, the shallower zones. If you remember looking at the whole core CT scan, you saw high concentrations of clay that kind of, kind of pinched out. So those high, that, a, a large percentage of that total concentration of clay was smectite bound. So you need to go lower and target the lower part of the Springer in this case. And right here, I'm actually overlaying the whole core CT clusters that we mapped to those different sections. So looking back here, you can see that the deeper sections are the better sections. And based on the whole core CT analysis, which is the blue and the red, cluster one and cluster two, those are going to be your more porous regions with higher amounts of uh, connected organic matter hosted porosity. Everything's starting to add up here. So we're, we're slowly building our story. So let's do some comparisons, because many people here aren't familiar with whole course, um, dual digital rock analysis. Uh, looking at some distributions of data in the Eagle Ford. So this is part of Ingrain's library. Uh, we've, prob we've drilled over, we've, we haven't drilled, we've worked on over 1,200 wells acquiring this kind of information. And if you're looking at some of the statistics in the Eagle Ford, you can see 
uh, why it's such a popular reservoir, right? We got the average 2D pore, so we call it 2D pore. This is porosity quantified from 2D images. This is going to be our effective porosity, uh, average of about 3.17, so there's a lot of bad wells in there. You got some of the high values, though, sitting in the 9 to 10% to range, which are, this, that's a prime acreage, you know. Uh, organic matter average is 5.62%, and the average for the organic matter host porosity is 1.3%. If you look at the distribution here, you can see there's a high amount of those being weighted down at the bottom. There's a lot of wells that were drilled kind of outside of that target, that uh, prime acreage area, so that's driving down our statistics. So I'm still working on analyzing this data, but I'm going to try to break that out based on regions within the Eagle Fur to show why things are producing better than others based on this kind of information. So I'm not there yet, uh, but keep a lookout because I will be presenting this kind of work coming out in the future. Uh, Wolf Camp, very popular right now, right? Uh, average uh, porosity is 1.69 percent. That's got a lot of bad wells in there. Got a, there's not as many bad wells in the Wolf Camp now than really anywhere else, but uh, we, we get percentages as high as 7 or 8 percent porosity, effective porosity in the Wolf Camp. So really understanding and getting into those zones is what you want to do. Uh, average organic matter is about 5.6 percent, so very similar to the Eagleford as far as organic matter is concerned. And, uh, but a less, less of that is organic matter hosted. And that's very s simple to explain. If you've done any work in the, the Wolf Camp, you'll notice that it's a very finely laminated rock with uh, siliceous to calcareous uh, sequences occurring over. And in all those calcareous sequences, there's hardly any organic material. And then as soon as you hit a siliceous sequence, and this is happening at the millimeter scale, tons of organic material. So the porosity, is, it's a bimodal porosity system in the siliceous rock versus the calcareous rock, where in the calcareous rock, it's mostly just intergranular or intergranular pores, but in the siliceous rock, it's organic matter hosted pores. So the Wolf Camp is a very complicated reservoir, and we're still working on trying to understand what's the mechanism for production in this reservoir right now. Uh, but if you're familiar with doing any work in the Wolf Camp, you know that a lot of water is being produced out of there, and so it makes sense because there's a lot of organic, intergranular and intergranular hosted porosity which are likely non-wetting or water wet. So these are probably more than likely the pathways where water is running through in these carbonate str uh, strings where, hyd where hydrocarbons may be kind of going through these silicious strings kind of neighboring each other. So there's a mix between that and understanding that is something we need to work to as an industry. So now we're looking at Woodford. Porosity average about 2.4 percent. Um, organic matter hosted or organic matter, 7.27%, so a little higher there. Uh, organic matter hosted porosity, 0.9%. So it's not as good as the Wolf Camp, not quite as good as the Eagleford, but excellent for the current prices right now. And I have it labeled here as the Goddard. It's the Springer Shale, but it's the Goddard Shale, technically, if you want to be really specific. And you can see in this case, uh, 2D porosity is about 4%. Uh, summary of the organic matter is about 7.5 percent, which is very similar to the Woodford, and, but on the higher end, that's why you saw it, where it fell on the 2D, on the, the permeability plot. And the organic matter hosted porosity is very high at 2.33 percent, so that's why it's on the much higher, higher end. So on the Woodford, it's about near 1 percent, but in the Springer, it was about 2.33, and that's why it's done so well. So here I'm laying out all four of those in a cross plot of 2D, pro, 2D organic matter hosted porosity versus 2D <coughs> effective porosity or the total 2D porosity. And as you, as you get closer to this, this line here on the top, this Y is equal to X line, that means the more of the porosity is organic matter hosted. So you really want all of your rock to kind of fall in this region and you want to avoid falling in, down here in these regions. Uh, but this means you're dealing with more intra or intergranular porosity. Over here, you're going to be dealing with organic matter hosted porosity. So this is going to be ideal for keeping those hydrocarbons flowing through your matrix. So now I'm just kind of highlighting the Goddard or the Springer. The Springer versus the Woodford. And you can see, once again, the Springer is falling in the high end here. And if I were to kind of change the size of these, these markers here, based on volume percent of organic matter, you can see that the Woodford is a little bit higher. 
to the reds. They grow a little bit more. The blues don't grow as much, and that's because the wood fruit is world class and it has a little bit more organic matter. But the type of porosity that's being created in the Springer is right up there in, in the zones you want it to be. A majority of your porosity is organic matter hosted in nature. Um, then I'm just showing you just kind of by state here. So we have NA for some of those clients who did not tell us where their core came from, but they said it was Woodford. Um, and it, but most of it, uh, Oklahoma and Texas, you actually don't see a big difference in the Woodford. Um, it's fairly consistent, so you have bad Texas and good Texas Woodford, and you have bad, obviously bad and good uh, Oklahoma City Woodford, or Oklahoma State Woodford. So going back to the polished surface, I'm going to take a step back here and investigate what's possible. What else am I, what else can we be doing in the next couple of years with digital rock analysis? So one of the most interesting aspects to me is textual analysis from images. Because that's something we do as geologists all the time. We look at rocks and we build interpretations and we look at the textures and it tells us a lot about the diagenesis of the rock and a lot about the history and ultimately it can lead us to some uh, interesting conclusions about how to best produce from a specific formation. So what I'm showing you here on the left is a unresolved image. So this is, per, this is an image from the overview. I'm actually taking that overview from the polished section and I'm just cropping out one little section. And you can see it's kind of fuzzy it's because we're, we're not acquiring at a very high resolution there. But at some point we have to start zooming in and taking high resolution images to start resolving features in the pores from where we compute all of our volumetrics. So how do we make that decision? Is it just random? Are, are you sh am I sure that I'm actually acquiring those images in the representative areas, yes or no? Uh, so we developed this technique so that it could actually look at a tex textual analysis over the polished section and tell us statistically where to select, uh, where, where to zoom in for our images that kind of cover all the different fabrics that we're, that we're measuring at that scale. And ultimately, if you can do that, you could start res relating the fabrics. So on the left, I'm showing you fabric textures. So every color is a sim similar fabric, geologic fabric. And if I were to overlay the properties I resolve on the right, which are the resolved pores, with those fabrics, I can actually build some models. And if I build some models, so I'm showing you 19 fabrics here, Woo, it's a lot. Uh, you can actually use a geologist to go over that and simplify those fabrics based on their knowledge of the area. But you start to build information like this. So this is an entire polished overview running a fabric or texture segmentation program, which is a deep learning based algorithm that looks at the intensity values spatially from all the different pixels and populates them into this information here and then tells you so the, every color is similar texture. And then it tells you, take images in these locations in order to capture all the, dis the distribution of all the textures equally. And that's important because you don't want to misrepresent the rock you're imaging. So you want to make sure that you've captured all the different textures or geologic features in the rock. Uh, and you can ultimately give answers that are representative. So at the end of the day, you have some whole core. You build a geologic framework. And you use that framework based on whole core CT, which is high resolution resolving, to pick where you take your sidewall or, or where you're going to plug uh, statistically. And then you start investigating those at high resolution and quantifying this kind of information, porosity information. The end game is to be able to take that information because you've taken a stair step approach, right? One step at a time is to start walking right back up those stairs, one step at a time, and populating all of that information at the fine scale, at the nano scale back to the whole core scale. So this is kind of a review of what we're trying to populate here. ATR, organic matter hosted porosity, intergranular porosity, the effective porosity, and get back to this scale, the, wire, the, the whole core CT scale. As a core analysis company, this is, this is kind of the end of the road for us, right? But for an operator, this is just the beginning. Because as soon as you get the information at this core scale, you have to then integrate it with the petrophysical, like the wireline scale. That way you can step out in your areas where you have less well control and learn, use this knowledge to help you better drive target landing zones uh, as you step away from those areas where you don't know as much. So in this case, I'm showing you the entire data set from the whole core, but on the last two columns, I'm showing you upscaled information. So this column on the, the, the second to the left here, this is a porosity type log. And this column is a permeability log. And it's based off of a strategic selection of where to take these SEM images from. 
So this porosity type log, in green I'm showing you the organic matter hosted porosity. So I really should keep the colors consistent because in the images I was always showing you blue porosity is organic matter hosted. So just pretend that green is blue for now. But uh, that's the blue porosity, that's the organic matter hosted porosity. This is the porosity that we argued developed during the maturation process and this is the porosity that's key to helping you understand the reservoir quality you're dealing with. The red on top of that is, that's consistent now, intragranular and intragranular porosity that was red in the images. So that's that porosity and the gray is the clay bound water porosity added on top of that based on some of the physical lab measurements and even some XRD data sets where we knew the distribution of clays. So the sum of those three gives you your total porosity. So if you were to run and compare this to a GRI crushed rock uh, using a Dean Stark, you will compare very favorably with the sum of those three components. However, this, the sum isn't what we're really interested in as far as reservoir quality is concerned. We're really interested in the play between the green and the red, the organic matter hosted porosity and intragranular porosity, and how well are they connected. That's really going to tell us a lot about the quality of our rock and how well, uh, how much we can produce from it. All else equal, right? You've done a good job completing the well. Uh, your drilling parameters have been excellent. No issues there, no geohazards. So this is kind of the base, the geology, the, the base that we have to work from here. So zooming in there, I'm kind of showing you those features once again. Uh, PAOM, which is the organic matter porosity. Red is the intragranular porosity. The sum of the, the green and the red here is the effective porosity, and this is the porosity that's actually going to be connected that can actually contribute to the hydrocarbon production in your rock. And then the sum of the, adding the gray, which is the clay bound water, is that sum of those three components is your, is your total porosity. So some conclusions, and then I'll open the floor for questions. Uh, both will study have, very similarly, have a very similar silica dominated lithology, and the average clay content is around 30%. Uh, that's around the same average clay content as the Woodford. Uh, TOC in the Springer is about 7.5% by volume. So the, the basic rule of thumb is divide that by two and you'll get your weight percent. So if you're dealing with LECO TOC data, uh, that's the rule of thumb, right? So you have to know a little bit about your carriage and types and uh, to get a better feel of your destiny, but, uh, density, but that's about it. Uh, effective porosity is about 4%. Uh, in some of the specific zones, we saw effective porosity as high as 7%. So really understanding the interconnectedness between those zones that are higher porosity and how they interact with maybe some of these little microfractures that I would argue are uh, in situ versus the ones that are probably created as the, pour, the rock is coming to the surface. That's going to help you really understand your production. Uh, all the samples have a, are primarily organic matter porosity. That's great. So your wettability conditions are going to be good in this reservoir. So you should be able to produce from this as far as matrix, uh, matrix properties are concerned. Uh, both wells follow a similar porosity and perm trend. So that's fairly consistent. However, one well, as I was telling Sean earlier, was drilled in the oil window and one was in the gas. But similar rock. Uh, high organic porosity and permeability relative to Woodford shale. So I showed you a little bit of an overlay of this kind of data in the Woodford and how it compared with the Springer. So you can see why the Springer was a kind of a, a nice little topic because it was, a, it was just free, it was free pay. It was free reserves for a lot of those people who had uh, excellent locations. They were really going for the Woodford and they happened to bypass some oil shows, investigated it, drilled a few laterals in it, produced very well and said, this is great, the value of my acreage just went up. Uh, LECO TOC, SCM TOC and upscale TOC are all in agreement. So we have a very consistent model here. We, we, there's not much left to the imagination as far as the geology is concerned. Completion design is another story. That's going to take a long time to really understand the best way to complete these wells, but at least we can pinpoint some of the geology. And overall, the Springer Shell Rock properties are, are very promising and um, probably going to see a lot more of these wells drilled in the future. But with that, thank you for your time. Based on Not in this country. But yes, yes. Okay. I've seen a lot of very interesting rocks that look very similar to the Eagleford in Columbia, for example. Uh, we did a huge project there about four years ago, and ever since then, the economics in Columbia haven't been well. But I imagine one day they will be better. And oh, um, that's a good question, Linda. We've, I've done some work in conjunction with a few operators where they were looking to base their EUR models 
off of these kinds of images. So this is something we did in the East Texas Eagleford and Halcon Resources is the one we did that with over about 19 wells. We actually acquired this kind of information on drill cuttings and they use this information to build an EUR model to fill in the gaps. Is it a one for one? I mean, in your estimation, is it like a linear correlation? No. So there's something else you need to know. In addition to porosity, there's something else you need to know to really predict EUR. Correct. And so that's a, that's a huge amount of things, right? So uh, completion design information, <coughs> length of your lateral, uh, how much sinusoidal, sinusoidal movement, how well did you geosteer and stay in the zone, how many per clusters per stage, uh, all that information, how much, what's the mesh size of your different propents you pumped, uh, how much total sand did you pump, uh, all this information goes into the, kind of an EUR model in conjunction with, I would say, total clay concentrations, which is important for fracture height and uh, TOC. Uh, then porosity comes in the, as well. So it's an it's a interplay, like I said, this is the base from a geologic understanding of at least you can check this off the list that, hey, I'm dealing with some good rock. Now you have to talk about pressures, which is a great question. Pressures, uh, how well am I going to complete this well? What kind of interplay with my clays do I have? Do I have any ash beds? Like if you're dealing with the Eagleford, you're going to have some of these ash beds occurring. Same kind of issue in the Vaca Muerta, they have ash beds. And so those are known to kill fracture height. You, you, if, you hit, if you hit an ash bed, it just destroys your energy and you get to slippage between planes and it goes out so you don't get a high fracture height. Uh, th there's a lot that goes into it and so um, it's one of those things that as you collect more data in the same region with a similar type of rock, you can actually uh, flesh a lot of those differences out specific to formation though. Brian, thank you very oh, much. I'm going thank to you. I'm going to give you our Secret here, our, our secret limestone <laughs> rattlesnake limestone speakers award. Thank you very much. From a hidden unknown quarry west of Boston. I like mysterious rocks. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. We expect the analysis.